that uh, all of the new speakers that you've attracted to webinars to your audience. So I think that's excellent that um, you know you continue to grow and reach out and to educate um, you know the petroleum engineering community uh, around um, uh, around India. So um, thank you again. I I must have done something right the first time for you guys to invite me back. Uh, and I very much appreciate the opportunity. Uh, well, I've got a little bit of a treat for you today. Um, I've This is kind of an update to a presentation that I've been giving for years. I, I, if, if you've seen some of my work, I, I'll frequently talk about the digital oil field 2.0 in terms of what the next generation of technology application and work process changes have come along the digital oil field since it's kind of early, um, you know, kind of beginnings about 20 years ago or so. But recently with all of the interest in um, uh, artificial intelligence and generative AI and chat GPT and all the, the different things that are coming out around that, I decided to take a, a little bit even further look into the future. And maybe some of that future isn't so far off actually. Uh, and and but talk about where all of this stuff potentially is leading and what some of the challenges are with regard to that. So therefore, the new title, Digital Oilfield 4.0, I'm advancing it in terms of a couple more generations. And then with the dot .ai, it's a little bit of kind of thinking about how more of these advances in um, um, data analytics are going to impact um, how we produce oil and gas and particularly some of the challenges that it may help us to face as we kind of move forward. So um, here goes uh, uh, with a, a look at the digital oil field 4.0.ai. Well, just like in, in, in many industries, um, data is really driving the energy business transformation. And, and I think one of the things I want to point out here, this is, a little bit of an oil and gas life cycle value chain sort of cartoon uh, from AWS of all people. We're not talking about, you know, so uh, an idea that is coming from within oil and gas industry. And that's kind of well, a tough couple of key points on this slide that I need to take a minute to really kind of absorb. You know, first of all, you've got a, it's not an oil and gas company. It's an oil and gas division of, uh, uh, cloud-based company of Amazon of all, uh, all people to try to describe, you know, how data is being used. So, an awful lot of the advances in digital um, that are coming in uh, uh, and impacting the oil and gas industry are no longer coming from oil and gas company research labs. Uh, you know, if you go back 20, 30 years. The invention of, of of almost all of the technology needed for oil and gas came from an internal kind of uh, of an aspect. Uh, it came from oil company research labs. It came from oil and gas uh, service company laboratories. It came from academic research labs that were funded by oil and gas. But essentially, it was a very proprietary, closed loop kind of an approach where we were inventing things for ourselves. And that whether that was, uh, like I said, high performance computing data centers, even I remember at a Chevron's research lab years ago, that we made our own color printer. Uh, why would we need to do that? That's something that would be a commercial product. Well, we needed something to plot the seismic sections exactly the way we wanted it. So we were, we're very close looking in, in, in terms of that. That's not true now. Uh, most of the digital advances that are happening you know, are, are happening outside oil and gas. So it's not a problem of invention anymore. It's a matter of adaptation of the right technologies because you've got the, the Silicon Valley, you've got the, you know, the, the advanced uh, di digital technology companies from China, from all over the world that are, they're the ones that are really coming up with these new advances. So oil and gas trying to apply them to the digital oil field ecosystems that we have, it's a matter of trying to understand what's going on outside our industry and pick and choose the right technologies and bring them in. And now instead of 
you know, uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, 10 years ago, this slide would have come from Halliburton or it would have come from Schlumberger or Baker Hughes or whatever, you know, that kind of thing is all, it would be all about. We really uh, now see AWS, we see Microsoft Azure, we see, you know, anal data analytics companies that, yes, they deal with oil and gas, but, but they deal with a lot of other things as well. So what we have, and, you know, is, is really now a, a, a dramatic 180 degree change in where technology comes from. And I'll, I'm going to go into that theme uh, as we go through this webinar. The other piece of this, I think, is an important thing that you should recognize that this is the energy business transformation, not oil and gas, not fossil fuels, not something as specific as what is really the core business of oil and gas companies. But many oil and gas companies are now seeing themselves or portraying themselves in a broader way as energy companies. This is particularly true of the European major oil, integrated oil and gas companies such as Shell or, or BP or uh, even Total renamed itself to Total Energies and BP is beyond petroleum and you know some different sort of things that they're trying to cast themselves in the new kind of context, global environmental context of decarbonization and net zero. And um, and the oil and gas companies are also investing in renewables, um, maybe in geothermal, maybe in, um, you know, different, um, you know, sort of ways that are broadening out their portfolio from just crude oil and natural gas to a broader range in the energy space. Well, whether that's the digital oil field anymore or the digital wind farm or the digital solar farm or whatever it is, it still is one that is dominated by lots and lots and lots of data. You know, again, that's a, that is a transformation that's that's happening everywhere. Sensors are cheap, sensors are, are rugged. We, we put them all over the place. We have so much data to deal with. So the challenge is, is what we can do with it. So that 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 is the challenge of digital oil field or digital energy ecosystem is how can we take all of this data and how and we obviously we still have our traditional uh drivers of being safe operations sell the traditional drivers of having low cost optimized efficient operations but now we want to also add to that and not not take away the others I add to that uh, a, a low carbon environmental footprint. And of course, in the end of the day, we want to make money. So the profitability issue still goes through all of this stuff. But it isn't that new performance metrics are, are coming in and replacing others. They're just adding on to the to the ones we already had, making the kind of the operations and business challenges even tougher. Well, we all know from the looking at the stock markets of the Western developed countries that the 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 companies that are attracting most of the stock value or the investments are these purely digital companies. I, I read an article the other day that called them the Magnificent Seven, but you have the the Google and the Alphabet, and the, of course Microsoft is hung in there and they've they've uh, stayed in the game. Um, uh, they were obviously a big digital company with Microsoft Windows, but now that isn't even a big part of their uh, value portfolio anymore. It's their cloud services. So these, this is a place where the valuation of companies um, has really dramatically changed. I mean, ExxonMobil barely makes the, 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 the FT100 anymore. Uh, and that being the largest oil company is along with Aramco, uh, because you have these massive valuations of these companies that essentially have little to no physical assets. You know, if you look at their books, what their what their value is based on is data, what they can collect. Say an Amazon, all of the information it collects about you, Apple, all the data that it collects about you when you're using your cell phone. Um, I mean, again, the whole idea of me calling it a cell phone is a 
is a bit of a dinosaur sort of term because of the smartphone we rarely use to make phone calls anymore, right? If I want to communicate with my even my daughters, um, you know, I have to do text message. I'm going to communicate with my grandchildren. It's FaceTime. Uh, it's video sort of thing. So, you know, the idea that we have, you know, this used to be a phone is kind of an anachronism because now it is a digital platform that we might carry in our pocket or put in our purse or whatever it is. You know, it, it it's it's the data that these companies have used to create value, to sell whatever it wants to sell on Amazon, to use and improve your search capabilities, sell you advertisements. Well, all the different th ways that they create value from the data, but they really have very little physical resource. Now that's very unlike oil and gas, right? Because we have for a hundred years calculated the value of oil and gas companies by reserves in the ground, by the physical infrastructure we have, the wells, the processing equipment, the pipelines, the refineries, the whole value chain of a physical product. Now that, so that makes us different than this magnificent seven. But one of the things that is the same, and again, it, this obviously the magnificent seven didn't come from oil and gas. It came from its own digital revolution. But these other, uh, what, what we have in common is we have a lot of data. Now, where, where it is for this Magnificent Seven, that is their business model. For us, that is an asset by which we need to use to create the value propositions of a physical prominent, uh, dominated, you know, kind of an industry. So this is kind of my insight here, and this is probably the one major slide if you're going to remember anything you could you know take notes on this one is that these nine um kind of trends or themes if, if oh, that's really taken off in the last just decade i mean they're we're not going back that far but all of these happened outside oil and gas these are the things we need to adapt to but we did not invent so that changes kind of the perspective on technology. Yes, there's a lot of technology. There's physical technology as well as this digital technology. I'm just gonna focus on digital here, you know, in this webinar. But all of these things happen outside the boundary of oil and gas industry, but they are relevant to the digital oil field and are increasingly relevant to that. And I'll get to this last point about so what is artificial intelligence, generative AI going to do to the digital oil field? We've already mentioned the first one, the rise of digital only firms. But clearly, and one of the things that's been going on from even digital oil field 1.0 is the automation and the digitization processes that, are, that have been going on. A lot of these actually came from manufacturing industries where we have turned certainly in North America and uh, with the shale revolution, we have turned drilling and completion and production into a manufacturing like process. You know, you didn't have one custom well, you drilled 10 wells the same way. So you have a well drilling process and it's a well manufacturing process as well. You're drilling a well, but you're manufacturing the same kind of thing over and over and over again in order with then with that economies of scale, we were able to reduce costs dramatically. And uh, by understanding the reservoir for, through completion practices, production practices, reservoir management, enhanced oil recovery, we were able, and, but looking at it as a manufacturing model, that was digital oil field 2.0, that we were able to, again, just unlock a tremendous resource. The United States went from an oil importing nation to the uh, second largest oil exporting nation. So other things like the edge computing, cloud computing, we'll talk a little bit about some of those advances, which again, clearly are IT. They are, they're not petroleum engineering per se, but they allow us to create the connectivity between field and office in the digital oil field and collect massive amounts of data in a, a very different kind of way. I mean, back 20 years ago, we were, every oil and gas company had its own proprietary data center. And that was a major part of the 
IT group's responsibility was running that proprietary data center. Well, those don't exist anymore. Uh, we, you know, big oil companies buy services from Microsoft and AWS and maybe IBM or Google or, 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 or whatever. And, and so again, they, that physical infra, uh, data center infrastructure, we, we've outsourced. It's now a, as a service back to oil and gas. There are some not such good news in the cybersecurity impacts to industrial systems we'll, we'll just mention as we go through this. Clearly, the information intensity of our business has grown, but that doesn't mean all data is good data. And that, that drives an awful lot of what we're going to get to and the idea of if we're going to build data-driven predictive models of our applications using machine learning or uh, other forms of artificial intelligence, we need to understand what data we're training that model on. And often it's not a lot of data, but often it's not very good high quality data. So understanding that issue, the whole idea of trust, you know, that gets into the idea of security. Uh, it gets into this issue of can my application find the best data in order to drive that. With that, I can become not only responsive, I can become predictive. But if it's bad data, it's the old garbage in, garbage out kind of model, and we can react to a predictive result that's very complex, but it's just flat wrong because it probably violates a couple laws of physics along the way with because of the bad data. We clearly are using high performance computing and digital platforms. Well, I'm going to mention a little bit of one I think is a very interesting new um, kind of innovation in the industry. We're trying again to standardize on our digital platform. So we'll mention something about that, but and increasingly, once you've got all this data, our, our attention focuses on the analytics uh, and we all wanna become better Python programmers. Uh, but don't forget your petroleum engineering. I mean, it's clearly something that yes, a petroleum engineer now has to be a decent anyway programmer. No, you don't have to be as good as a computer scientist, but because we've got low code, you know, you know, sort of programming tools that makes it a lot easier for the engineer to write the programs. Um, we, it's still, uh, you know, a, a phase that is now part of everything we do. I mean, in my classes, I gave homework assignments that required students to use Python to create an artificial neural network on a predictive model for the predictive maintenance on critical equipment. And that was a petroleum engineering class. That was not a data science class. That was not a computer science class. It's now what we expect from petroleum engineer. And I know if you go back 20 years ago uh, about the, the, the best uh, data processing tool a petroleum engineer had was Excel. And I, we've broken Excel now with all of these kind of advances. And we're moving on to a lot of other interesting new things. And then we'll 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 finish up just mentioning a little bit about where generative AI may lead all of us. But before we kind of get overwhelmed with all this new shiny toy technologies advances that are coming along, there's some real truths about the data that we are collecting in our business. Yes, we say we're digital, digital oil field. Everybody's got a digital transformation program. And, and many large oil companies have been doing it for years. So that's not breaking news when you we talk about that. But when you really look behind the scenes at the data, <clears throat> excuse me, data is never clean. Uh, and you're gonna spend a lot of your time, not on the fancy algorithm, but on cleaning the data and preparing it for the application. And you'll find out that most of the time, a basic, analytical approach works. You know, regression analysis is a wonderful thing and we don't always need machine learning. Uh, and, and a lot of the tools of the, of the ARPS equation for production decline curves we, or the, the physics-based solutions such as Darcy's law for computational fluid dynamics, those things still work. Don't, don't overlook those just because a, there's a shiny new toy called chat GPT. That uh, that's in there in order to try to, to help you with. So an awful lot of the problems we have in the oil field are solved with the tools we already have in, in our pocket. 
Now there's some that are not, and that's the, the new fields of opportunity as you go through this. But a lot of the things, it is, you know, the tools we already have, just applied right are, 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 the, are the, the best things that we can do. Big data is just a tool, it just, it's, but it's more than just lots of data. It's more than just the volume part of it. Actually, the volume part is the easiest part because, you know, with data lakes and, and, and other sorts of uh, technology, we had had a lot more data than we ever have before. The problem is the variety of data we are collecting and the difficulty in integrating all of this into a more holistic model or holistic view of the oil field. That's the challenge. And I, when I talked before, I'd measure what matters in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That complexity of data types is still preventing us from really creating a, a very good holistic view from top down and bottoms up of the model. And then, the, you know, the end of the day, we we get all um, absorbed with the tools and the methodologies. And when we go to present to management, they don't care how we did it. They really want to know the answer. They want to know how can you tell, what is it that you're telling them to do differently? What what to invest in differently? And, and this is something where the role of the petroleum engineer is, is really dramatically changed over all of this digital oil field generations. It used to be we were asked to say what has happened in the past, history matching on reservoir characterizations, things like that. And up till what is happening right now through status systems and production engineering automation systems, we still have to do those. Those are still important tasks. But now we are asked to be future tellers with these predictive models. They, the management wants to know what's happening now, sure, but what they're really interested in is what's going to happen. Should they drill another well? Should they invest in a water flood? Should they, you know, uh, you know, go into and find a an electrification solution for their operations to knock down scope one and scope two emissions on, on their operations? You know, it's it is what's going to happen next, and how can you help me to make future oriented investment decisions? That's what they want to know. They don't want to care out what kind of model or what kind of programming language, what kind of pl uh, platform you use. They want to know the answer to a very real business problem. And the, the, uh, the one of the other things I guess I found uh, going from back into academia is professor's view of data is very different than the real world. Uh, when the professor doesn't have enough data for his experiments, we just simulate the data in a laboratory environment. And so data is always pretty good shape. Data always kind of leads you to a, 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 con a conclusion for the model. And, and, and you learn the, the methodology or the technique inside the university uh, walls. But when you go to the real world, you get go back to step number one, data is never clean. Data is hard to find. Data is hard to put together with regard to these things. So we, you know, I guess in academia, we began the process but then you have to go to the real world to find out how how much data you can get a hold of. That's the good news. How bad the data quality is, and then how vulnerable your system is to hacking. Presentation will be a key. Telling a story with data is something that I'm, I'm fascinated by, and I'll I give a lecture. I gave a lecture in my classes that's how to tell a good story with data because that's exactly what you're going to have to do over and over and over again. But then there's an, the other part of it, which is how someone can try to lie to you with statistics. And again, data could be manipulated, even unintentionally, uh, in terms of how you display your charts and things. So you have to worry about that. And the, the, again, kind of the idea is you're never gonna get a perfect model. You're never gonna get a perfect data set. So all models are wrong in terms of precision and accuracy and their their you know forecasts always being right on, but most of the but many of these models when done right are useful and and that's what's important from all of these models. It isn't to get the perfect model; it's to get a recommendation that is useful and creates value to the company that you try to have. And you know you, with all of these new tools, and they're getting better every generation. And I think that one of the things about the technology advances from the outside to oil and gas 
is a generation of digital technology is about six to nine months. I mean, it happens very, very quickly. Uh, a generation of physical technology in the oil field sometimes takes 20 years. That, that's, you know, the, you may be dealing with legacy SCADA systems of that old in an, in an oil field. So one of the real challenges in this adaptation is a different in terms of the time scales that some of this invent, uh, this innovation happens. Well, if you look behind the scenes because of how much data is coming into um, oil field companies, data management systems, we it's it's overwhelmed our traditional relational database sort of technologies. So, you know, just when you think about where how all of this this did volume and variety and velocity, you know, of, of a big data sort of challenge comes from, we've just stuffed the data anywhere and everywhere. And that's presents this integration challenge. You know, you go in here and you say, well, I want the five books that are on this particular topic. Well, that's what you do as a petroleum engineer when you go back and you want to create a model of reservoir performance or uh, well performance or or a, a pump performance or something like that. You want scattered data from all the rest of this place. Data discovery is hard because none of this data was actually collected with a singular integrated holistic model in mind it just came as it, as it came right and the poor data management people have to you know kind of just keep the library going find a place even to stick the new book on the table this is how the, what the data management systems have evolved to now it's not a good answer but it's evolved to because of the very rapid increase in the amount of data that's come into the oil and gas business so here's here's kind of this evolution of what I've called the IT OT convergence. And obviously this slide comes from, from somebody else, but I've been talking about this idea that the whole idea of IT really grew up in the computer science world, right? The data center world, the programming world with regard to that. And it largely had to do with corporate systems. Industrial automation or often called operations technology for OT really grew up in the field. It grew up in the world of electrical engineering, network, uh, it came, grew up in the world of mechanical engineering and control systems. And yet it became digital as well. And about uh, in the, say 20 years ago, 15 years ago, these two technology streams collided. Now, convergence is a nice word because when it first started, it was not nice, it was, a very real conflict of cultures, vocabularies, proprietary technologies, et cetera. And it took most oil and gas industries, just like it did most industrial industries, a while to get these two groups to learn how to talk to each other, how to play together in the same room. Uh, but we, we are making a lot of progress on that now. And you know, I you know, have to admit, it was more the influence of the IT side on the OT side, that has made a difference in how all these things work. Now, the, the other side of the coin on that is a lot of the vulnerabilities in terms of the, the cybersecurity issues that have plagued the IT system from the beginning now have begun to become field-oriented problems as well. But really, we're now dealing in a world where these two have to work together, and advances in the two have to recognize what's going on in the rest of the infrastructure so all of the rest you know these kind of things where you go all the way from the company's corporate finance system or legal system or procurement system hr systems which are in the erp model and then you get down to mes which is a plant industrial system kind of an approach and then you begin to see SCADA, the programmable logic controllers the io devices on particular smart equipment it is all now a, a, a consistent architecture that uh, the data has to move back and forth. And, and the, the, the important thing is when in digital oil field 1.0, it, all the data really moved in one direction and moved from the field to the office. Now, in where we are having now, we, we'll talk about that. And it is, it is not only bi-directional, it's multi-directional 
because we are sharing data with oil field service, you know, sort of partners. And where stuff is going to go now really has to do with not only hardware, not only software, it's the, it's a conversion of all of it into one sort of thing, almost as a service, because in a sense of the day, you're not going to own most of this stuff. You just are interested in the data from it. So here's where this IT driven um, data arc, you know, physical kind of comes from uh, computing and, and communications technology, ICT, as uh, acronym usually goes. And and the, the real great advance here was the Internet of Things devices. Again, not an oil and gas thing. It, it came from telecommunications. And with this, the smart devices, the smart vehicle, the smart equipment, you can say the smart pump, the smart artificial lift unit, the smart compressor, the smart, you know, uh, 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 you know, equi uh, equipment out in the field that is that we are able to not we go from just a sensor that records pressure and temperature readings. We are now being able on that little IoT device to have you know storage, networking uh, technologies, um, GPU location sensitive, you know, kind of interest, even processing capabilities. I can take a little piece of that model, predictive model about process automation, and I can store it in that chip that sits on top of the compressor. So the compressor does its part within that overall optimization scheme. So I don't have to have all the data going into a corporate center and then the instructions going back to the actuators on the smart equipment. I just put the model on the equipment and it runs itself under most conditions. Every once in a while, it runs into something it hadn't seen before, the model didn't predict before, and then you're going to have to recalculate the model. But this connectivity isn't just a static. This is where oil and gas is different than manufacturing. It isn't just a static plant architecture that man made, humans made the whole thing. You know, oil and gas is a place where human beings only made half of the system. Dive us the reservoir, hopefully, where we found it. Uh, and it's there's a lot of and we never go down and, and actually take a look at it. We never we never build an oil gas reservoir. We take advantage of it. We have we have a ton of indirect measurements about its performance, but it, it is something that just is there and we have to cope with and we have to deal with all the uncertainties and dynamic changes in behavior of oil, gas, water behavior in the reservoir. And we have to accommodate that. We build the top side. But we were given by nature the reservoir, and that is our factory. And it's a factory where half of it, the most important half of it, was uh, was not of human design. So we have to accommodate for all of the rest of that. Now, how do we do that? We have to do it dynamically. We have to do it with adjusted models. And this technology of the edge, and this first of all, it was the Internet of Things that was amazing. Then it was the cloud that allows us to store all kinds of data. And then the edge computing architectures allowed us to be at least near real time in a lot of our interactivity with data processing uh, and even send the model to the field, you know, kind of an idea as we go through this. So this edge computing sort of architecture really is now the basis for the digital oil field and is really the basis for the connectivity between the field and the office, the field and oil field service providers. I mean, if you need more chemicals in a, um, a particular, um, you know, well uh, performance issue, intervention issue, you, you know, that you could have the uh, the field connect directly with the service provider who where you buy your chemicals from, and they'll come in and 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 refill your uh, your tanks. Uh, the, you don't need the office anymore. You've got a pre-approved contract with a bunch of suppliers. So all of a sudden, the supplier is part of your network. That's a good thing. If the supplier is not secure, that's a great place that where your hack can happen. So just a couple slides on cybersecurity. I can give a whole talk on cybersecurity, but I pulled this one up here recently. And it's talking about, well, you all say, well, we're secure, I've got a password, right? Well, here in the world of 2022, when the hackers have 
just as much compute power as you do. If you have a, uh, a password that has, say, six characters, and it's full of numbers and upper and lowercase letters and symbols, all of the, the best practices your IT department tells you about, if you have a six character, you know, sort of password, essentially the hacker has the capability of going through that password almost instantaneously. Now think about that. How many of us look and say, well, what is my password like? Well, you, you probably not much security at all. And, you know, again, if, if I have an eight, if I go all the way up to an eight character one, it may take the hacker, you know, 40 minutes to hack through that that password, just through the random processing sort of code. So you have to have a, a, a security system that is based on a lot of different things, not just a password. We think that we're protected by a firewall on our, our external network. We think we're protected by a strong password sort of scenario. All that does is slow the, the, the hacker down just a little bit. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, we are much more vulnerable than we think. And so all of these sort of changes, the bad guys have computers too. The bad guys have access to this technology as well. And I've read articles recently where we are now having AI protected security systems being attacked by AI enabled malware. And it's a huge digital battle you know, at the, uh, not only just at the firewall, but in many places throughout our entire system. So we're, we're not as secure as we think. And back about 20 years ago, the world changed with the, with the idea of this malware called Stuxnet. This was the world's first virus that was designed specifically for industrial control systems. Now, not oil and gas, so this is another one of those things we've inherited from outside. But this was a, a third party government attacking an, a uranium enrichment facility in Iran. And it attacked through the, the, the plant's process control system, the centrifuges used to enrich uranium. And it worked. And it burned out hundreds and hundreds of, of centrifuges and set the, the, the plant's progress of enriching uranium back months. But then it got out into the real world. It escaped into the internet. It was captured by a number of good actors and by a number of bad actors. And ever since they've been working with this code and modifying it and creating other sort of, of, sort of packages. So your contr industrial control system is now a target. I mean, they aren't just trying to steal your, so your identification number and your credit card information and and things like that from your your smartphone, they're attacking our industrial control systems, and they're taking over and they are uh, resetting control information. I read one, you know, really bad sort of thing that they're actually uh, attacking a, a human safety system so that humans were at risk. It isn't just the process and uh, maybe shutting down a piece of equipment and stopping production or something. They they're doing that. And I I had a guest speaker at one of my classes. It was talked about they had a very automated, connected drilling rig that was uh, you know had tremendous connectivity with a control with their control system that were hundreds of miles away, but uh, it was attacked by a denial of service uh, you know side of kind of malware and issues and the, and the drill rig was down for a couple of days. It was not because there was anything really wrong with the drilling rig. It was the communication systems that were hacked. So anything is very, is, is vulnerable these days. And uh, that's this is a, a vulnerability we've inherited from the outside. We have become, in a lot of ways, data rich. When I, when I was first in the industry, we were data poor. And uh, you know, a lot of my seismic interpretation uh, you know, uh, work was a lot was more art than science. I mean, I I essentially envisioned a model. I had a little bit of data to to validate it with, and then I created what I thought the subsurface was all about. I had a few seismic lines, had a few well, uh, you know, data points, but but it was art. Uh, it was data poor in terms of what I would or I really needed for an application. 
today the problem is you're, we are so data rich. It's finding the data that we already have is some of the biggest challenges. And then how we use it, you know, it's, we still use a lot of spreadsheets. We still use a lot of inflexible static reports when really we have the data available to produce dynamic performance dashboards of what's going on five minutes ago instead of what's went on six months ago. So clearly it's this integration challenge. It's this connecting the back end, which is now dramatically different to how we use the data. Looking at this challenge is a lot more complicated than most management thinks. How to produce a coherent, dynamic, real, trusted view of oil field operations. Uh, you know, when we have the data, it may not be all great data. So data quality is still an issue. But this this data management value creation journey, you know, this one, um, you know, consultant kind of talked about is really a complicated step. And most engineers don't know about it. Most management doesn't know about it. It is the poor data management community, uh, you know, sitting trying to manage all of the data for you so that it makes your job easy, that you have some intuitive interface where I can just have my get my data button and all of a sudden I'm doing what I'm paid to do and building my reservoir model or something. Uh, it, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that we need to appreciate and we need to invest in and we need to get right. Well, I, I, there's, I talked about data storytelling and um, in a sense, there's two different kinds of data storytelling. One is stories about the data. Now you might call that data profiling, data discovery. There's all kinds of words that, uh, you know, that you can use, but it really is a try, a, trying to figure out what, what data I have and how good is it? And what is it, what information that I have before that? What is the better data? What is the truth? You know, when, when we talk about all that, what is the quality of the data? Is it reference to a common industry or company, you know, kind of index ma a master data uh, catalog? All of these sort of things, are the units of measure the same? Uh, are the, you know, do I have all of the data that where I could do the, the timestamps, you know, correctly if you go through that? So understanding the data is one kind of story that we tell from data profiling. Then we have what, you know, we all think is the, the, the cooler step is the story about data with analytics. And that's building these predict, data-driven predictive models guided by physics when we know them, uh, but even when we don't know them, like the whole concept of shale is not a reservoir that fits the assumptions of what Darcy's law. Uh, so clearly we had to go beyond physics to understand a shale reservoir. And we did it because we had tons of data. And then we build a model from the data, a little bit black box in terms of what the performance is, but we could still build a model even though the physics was not well understood. And with that, we, we can do data analytics on lots of different things. We don't really understand the physics of a pump, but we've got enough data about a pump to create a model to make that pump work more efficiently, use less fuel, have less emissions, et cetera, as we go through that. But whatever kind of story you're trying to tell with this data, the first thing you really need to understand is the business problem comes first. It's not the data, it's not the technology, it is the business problem that comes first. This is where the petroleum engineer's skill set is still paramount because it's a petroleum engineer that should understand the business. Maybe you're not the best programmer in the team. Maybe you're not the best technology guy or woman on the team, but you are the person who knows the business problem. So you have to guide this process and you know a little bit of programming to help the programmer create the best model. You know a little bit about the technology to guide the right, you know, the, the understand what the technology you have available out in the field. Sometimes you may be dealing with a brand new oil field that's got today's technology. More often than not, you're gonna be dealing with a, a legacy oil field with a SCADA system that's 20 years old and you need to understand the technology that you have 
and be able to build your solution from that. So this doesn't, this changes the job of a petroleum engineer. It doesn't replace the petroleum engineer within the system. Well, we were first a bit panicked about all this data that we were going to, that we were acquiring, because all of a sudden sensors were cheap. We, instead of 100 sensors on a platform, we put 100,000 sensors on an offshore platform. And, and an offshore platform was as well instrumented as a modern manufacturing plant was. And so what are we gonna do with all of this data? It overwhelmed our communication systems. It overwhelmed our traditional uh, relational database, you know, sort of technology. But again, uh, from the outside, we have a solution. It's called a data lake. And, and the data lake essentially allowed us to store all of this data in whatever frequency it was uh, available. Now, we it, it dramatically changed a really important process, which is how we acqu acquire the data. We shifted the problem of transforming all of this raw data into some structured format. We, we, we transferred that from the front end of the model, the data management part, to the data analyst part. So now this data comes in, however it comes in, and we can store it, we can capture it. Data Lake is essentially a, a massive folder structure where the data comes in and with minimal contextual information, but it's all there. And if you want it minute, at minute by minute, you can get minute by minute instead of some summarized or stored you know, kind of version of it. But now all of a sudden the, that task to, of data profiling goes to the analyst because the data management people didn't have the time to do their normal extract, transform, and load sort of process. They did, they did an extract load, and you have to transform the data when it goes into these things. And now we've got this evolution into something that's called a data fabric now, because it includes an awful lot of different things to store all of the different kinds of data. Time series needs an historian. A, an image database processing uh, requires something else. Pro production information, something else. You know, essentially we've got a lot of different types of technology to manage different data types, but now we have to pull it, you know, together into a holistic model. Well, I said I'd mention something about a new idea around the idea of data platforms. Again, the whole idea of data platforms is, is not new. That's what Amazon has. That's what AWS uh, has it within its analytics. That's what Azure has it, it within its analytics. And essentially they have developed a data platform so they can do their business. The oil and gas industry is now starting to try to do the same thing and agree on a standard approach. And the, the key thing here is something called OSDU that's sitting down there in the bottom. It stands for Open Subsurface Data Universe. And it is another industry collaboration attempt to create a modern data platform, this time focused not on the data element, but on workflows, because that's what's really important. But we're, we're beginning to shift this mentality from data at rest, which is I need to collect a piece of data and put it in the right relational data store so that I can find it with a SQL query someplace down the line. We're now trying to figure out how this data should be organized in terms of an important workflow, drilling a well, producing a well, uh, you know, producing a field. I mean, those sort of things. Is, it's, so it's now in terms of workflow tasks and this application interoperability, which is this kind of next generation of how we, of, of a data platform for oil and gas activities. So OSDU, if you want, it is more, they have their own websites, their own committees, and there's a, a lot of information about that. Drilling is probably the first application that will benefit from this sort of thing. But again, like I kind of talked about with that data journey map, if you look behind the scenes, it's complicated. There is a, a, a lot more data sources. There's this whole concept of needing to build models. But in building models, how you know how do we use the right amount of data? In many model applications, it isn't more data that makes a better model. It's just the right kind of data that makes a, a better model. You can overcomplicate and introduce bias 
into your models very easily with just throwing all the data you have at it. So the whole idea of model development, the feature engineering, the uh, there's model deployment. Obviously, that's where the, you know you make you can tell the management what they need to know, uh, and essentially the whole idea of visualization all become critical elements of what goes on behind the scenes. And more and more, the petroleum engineer gets pulled into this. They, you first of all, you're the user, but then you you, has, you need to know more and more about the data lineage of the data you're using. Just the last couple of things. I'm going to come at the end here um, before I get into uh, generative AI. We are now changing the interface between us and the machine. This human machine interface has is, is long been an element of uh, process control sort of technology. And, and first of all, it was mostly uh, what kind of dashboard performance screen can I put up there so the human recognizes when when there's an alert, when when there's an alarm in the system, et cetera. So this goes back 20 years. It's not just now happening, but it is changing in a very dramatic kind of way. And while we are, there's a whole load of computer science on how to develop a good screen and good charts and how all of this infra volume of information can be visible to the human being so they know what to do in terms of, uh, you know their their parts you know when they see it but it is now being kind of transformed through again some another piece of technology that came from the outside through voice and all of a sudden now we can talk to that interface alexa you know what's the what what's the temperature outside alexa what's the weather going to be this afternoon alexa what is my production forecast and which wells are underperforming the models that I have. Why not use the smart assistant, uh, you know, of voice translation technology to use that as an interface to this complex C, uh, machine ecosystem that sits behind the, the model. I, I've actually worked on a project that was trying to teach the language of production engineering to a smart assistant piece of technology so that we can just then talk to it like we talk to our uh, consumer oriented sort of technology now we're we're way behind what uh what the consumer is doing apple hasn't really come into the oil industry and transformed what we can do but it's possible this is not a real hard technology problem it just needs someone to sit down and teach alexa how to speak oil and gas and it's possible and someday somebody's going to do it. So here's my last slide. And I, I want to really kind of talk about the role of AI and artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, uh, are some very, very powerful statistical correlation tools. And they can do amazing things. But it really depends on us training those models correctly with the right amount of data. Though we now have some of these tools that are trained on the wrong kind of data, giving very deceptive results, some often unintentionally. And we don't, you know, the AI isn't out there to get us. It's, a, it's only as good as the data that we put in. And, but it's moving and so fast. And obviously we're talking about, you know, that again, every six months is a new, generation uh, it's almost that ai is as moving from being just a tool to being a coworker and of course now there's some fear that it be my competitor that could do my job better than i could do my job so there's a, a threat of ai replacing humans i don't think that's our future i'm not that uh pessimistic about it i think what it is though it's going to push us to be better it's going to push the engineer into a different sort of role. We don't have to populate spreadsheets and and do the the charts and graphs anymore. That the AI does that much better than we can. It processes data much faster than our brain does. But our brain understands patterns, and our brain understands the physics behind some of these answers. It, it hopefully can recognize when when the answer 
uh, is not realistic. Uh, it, it violates the second law of thermodynamics, right? It's it's essentially a nonsensical answer, which these models can easily produce with the wrong data. So the human being becomes the model trainer from the right kind of data and the right kind of physical constraints. Then it becomes the overseer of the model results and helping to continuously improve the model to get better and better uh, sort of answers. And to throw out the garbage, you know, when when you see all the way uh, the rest through of that. I recently read an article about a, you know, we've all heard about Chat GPT 4.0 being trained on uh, essentially 20 years of internet data, and now we've got uh, you know the this whole challenge of the opportunity of, and it isn't just Chat GPT from OpenAI. It's Bard from Google. It's Copilot from Microsoft. It, and everybody's got a AI, a, a, a generative AI sort of solution. It is transforming search. I mean, already I don't have to search by typing something into the uh, the search box. I can talk to it. I said, you know, Alexa, find this for me. Um, and and so with this, it's transforming search. It's transforming data discovery. It is, but it is worrying us in terms of, um, you know. Who really generated this intellectual property concerns, et cetera? It panics old professors like me about you know your homework that you students could do. You know, if I assigned you a, a homework assignment, you could go to the Chat GPT website and have it do your homework for you. Matter of fact, I just kind of faced reality, and in my last class, I I assigned a homework assignment, and I told all the students to do just that, to go to the website Chat GPT. To have them do your homework assignment for you, but then sit back and read it and figure out where where you know how good it was. That's kind of the one of the first uh, scary things about it is it comes up usually with a pretty good answer, pretty believable response. But then what what is it missing? What what sort of thing did it not have in its model that you know as a human being, and so that you you provide. A better answer than the, the the generative AI you know did. So clearly, we are going to be working with this technology in a different way. It's going to change the role of petroleum engineers. It's not going to replace petroleum engineers. And in some cases, with these low code models, you aren't going to go to the computer science department to have them build a model for you. You're going to be able to do it. Like again, petroleum engineers knowing Python programming is not. And uh, something that we, we that will be uncommon as as we go into the future. This technology is not perfect, but it is amazing in a lot of different kind of ways. We can use it constructively, or we can just be lazy and use it in a in an appropriate way. So the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Is there any questions?